Now, would you argue that we've seen for the high risk stage two population, we treat them differently than a regular risk stage two, right? So regular risk stage two, we treat with fluorouracil therapy. We don't add the oxaliplatin in, right? But in the high risk stage two population, we've seen that oxaliplatin and fluorouracil is used. And there's some suggestions. It's decreasing, you... isn't it? Do you think? So my personal feeling is that we are decreasingly using um, oxaliplatin in high-risk stage. Even two. in so, the high-risk stage. Yeah, we'll say we, we we have analyzed now the the mosaic trial with a longer follow-up. We have seen that there is zero effect on overall survival, whether we use oxaliplatin in the high-risk stage two or not. So the overall survival yeah, so you, curves are and, exactly and, the same. And that's a good point. And also, if you look at the if you look at the use of adjuvant chemotherapy in the United States, certainly in the United States, in, in low, so-called low-risk T3N0s, the use of adjuvant capecitabine has gone down quite a bit over the last 10 years, meaning that the, the discussion that you're supposed to have with the patient about the pros and cons of adjuvant therapy, which there is some data to support adjuvant therapy, but there's a lot of data to suggest that that number needed to treat is so high that, that a lot of oncologists veer away from it, the use has gone down. And um, that, that's interesting because the tendency in, uh, is try to do less perhaps in these patients who are so likely to be cured from their, from their cancer otherwise. With respect to T4 disease, I, I think there is pretty good evidence that those folks do have obviously a uh, prognosis that's not that different from certainly N1 uh, disease, so they should be treated with some chemotherapy. Um, the big debate, as Dirk is saying, is should they get oxaliplatin or not, or should you just leave it alone with fluoropyrimidines? And should we do six months 5-FU or three months Folfox? Or right. three months C-Log? So it's getting more complicated, not less. So if we're guiding somebody who's watching this, yeah. right, so what do we want to tell them? In stage two, do we use do we, what are the molecular tests they need to get? MSI, mm -hmm. for sure, right? Because that will guide you chemo versus no chemo. Recurrent score, Dirk? Well, yeah, I'm not sure whether we, uh, these recurrent scores really help us, but uh, I think the risk factors should be clear and uh, insufficient lymph node count or examination is clearly number one and perforation obstruction is clearly number two and I think all the others don't really matter. Yeah. I use recurrent score extremely infre infrequently. Infrequently, I was okay. <laughs> it's the rare patient who, because it doesn't stratify the patients with, with, to the extent that you need. It doesn't really help you, and, and, and it certainly doesn't help predict the benefit of chemotherapy. It's a prognostic score that has a very narrow prognostic yeah. Yeah. guidance, so I'm also not a big user of that particular test. So MSI, and then clinically, knowing how many lymph nodes were removed and if that patient was a T4, and that might guide you towards treatment for the stage twos. Obstruction, Obstruction and perforation. Symptomatic, I think. The, the typical classical yeah. risk factors we know from the guidelines. And then we would do either a fluorouracil or a fluoropyrimidine or fluoropyrimidine plus oxaliplatin, depending on which side of the, of the coin you are sitting Ocean, on. Ocean, no. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I personally very infrequently would use Folfox in, in a stage two colon cancer. Um, I, I'm like Dirk, I'm, I look at that data and I'm not that, I'm not that compelled by the high risk stage two population within the mosaic and updated analysis. But, um, you know, it all depends on how many risks. I think these are the kind of things where you look at the patient and you say, well, they have T4 and poorly differentiated histology and bad lymphovascular invasion. And if they have a number of risk factors that m within st stage two categorize them as a more higher risk, then I think certainly these are the things you should weigh. And then you use Folfox for six months or Celox for three months? <laughs> well, that, that's, that's the next topic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah three exactly. versus but, six. No, but this gives some confidence. And I, here I, I would like to echo what Zef was saying. I think it's difficult to justify six months oxaliplatin based treatment in a stage two disease nowadays. Now, I think that's, for me, very, very likely over treatment if this is not a really poor candidate. Yeah, because we also have to remember for patients that we're curing, it's not only the long term neuropathy, which can be debilitating, but also for mosaic, we saw chance of leukemia happening years down the road from having received the platinum therapy. So it's not a decision that we want to take lightly. 
Really quickly, while we're still talking a bit about markers of risk of recurrence, Heinz, we talked a little bit, about, you mentioned circulating tumor cells. We've seen some data. What's the data that we're seeing? Is it ready for prime time? I'm not sure if it's ready for prime time, but the data are very, very um, exciting and I think promising for the future. Based on this data, phase three clinical trials are ongoing in the US where you are either positive for circling tumor DNA for stage two disease using the, the tumor circling tumor DNA for escalating, not de-escalating treatment options. So when you're positive, you're randomized to chemo versus no chemo, and the other ones are observed, like we just discussed. Now, we have to realize the frequency of positive liquid biopsy in stage two, around 8% based on publication. In stage three, about 20%. Now, if, when you look at this data, these positive carriers of circling DNA have an extremely high risk for recurrence. Basically, almost everyone recurs. So it's a very, very high risk factor, which potentially identifies the patients who recur and certainly should get um, aggressive treatment and not 5-FU alone and good for Fall Fox treatment. I think what is missing information is how many times can Fall Fox get rid of the circling DNA? How many patients can clear it under treatment? Because basically this is minimal metastatic disease. Mm -hmm. Is Fall Fox enough? Should we escalate it up to treatment like metastatic disease? These are all questions we don't know. And I think until we then, we will have to figure out stage three disease and clearance with adjuvant in a better way. But these trials or these projects are ongoing. So, so now, we've got stage two figured, sort of, 